Hi, welcome back to these short lectures on 19th and 20th century philosophy. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're going to be focusing in on mid-19th century British philosophy, um, particularly the work of John Stuart and Harriet Taylor Mill, um, and especially their famous co-authored work of liberal political philosophy, on liberty. Now, John Stuart Mill was born in 1806, and Harriet Taylor Mill, originally Harriet Hardy, was born in 1807. They met in 1931 and began collaborating almost immediately. Um, they married in 1851, two years after Harriet's first husband, John Taylor, died. From the beginning, John Mill idolized Harriet Taylor, and after her untimely death, um, he acknowledged significant debts to her in several of his works, most notably his Principles of Political Economy, the work we'll talk about today on liberty, uh, an essay, The Enfranchisement of Women, uh, which uh, he actually credited to her as the primary or sole author, um, and a variety of other works. Let's talk a little bit about their intellectual background. Um, so John Stuart Mill's father, James, was the product of the Scottish Enlightenment. The major figures you might be familiar with from the Scottish Enlightenment include uh, David Hume, the empiricist philosopher, uh, Adam Smith, the political economist. So these are major late 18th century Scottish thinkers, and that's the milieu that James Mill was trained in, and then James Mill became close uh, ally of Jeremy Bentham. Together, Bentham and James Mill developed the theory of hedonistic utilitarianism, according to which the ethical good is identified with um, maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain for the greatest number. And Mill and Bentham inspired a group of intellectuals uh, and political reformers and, and politicians known as the philosophical radicals. Now, John Stuart Mill received an extremely rigorous education at the hands of his father, James, mastering Greek and Latin and reading most of the classical canon by age 12, becoming an expert in math, logic, political economy, and science uh, in his mid-teens, writing his first treatises at the age of 15. Um, he became a true Benthamite utilitarian in ethics and in, in politics. But in his 20s, John Stuart Mill had a kind of a mental break, became somewhat dissatisfied with the life path he was on, and he became, he became increasingly interested in the British romantics, uh, particularly Wordsworth and Coleridge, uh, and the somewhat uh, more complex, more perhaps spiritual, you might say, picture of the human condition that they afforded. And he would go on throughout the rest of his life attempting to synthesize the sort of enlightenment empiricism and utilitarianism of his father with uh, the insights that he found in romanticism. Now in his own life, Mill was well known primarily as a politician and a reformer, as well as a philosopher, but primarily for his work in um, theoretical philosophy. He was a naturalist and an empiricist. He was also, he, he did a lot to advance our understanding of inductive inference and was um, an, a sort of important thinker in the early discussions of what would become philosophy of science. He was also a political economist, political economy being the 19th century science that would eventually become economics or become known as economics. Now, today, he's much more known for his work in ethics, um, where he defends a form of utilitarianism different from his father's and Bentham's, which is sometimes called eudaimonistic utilitarianism, also for his defense of liberalism in political philosophy. And as I said, he was also a political economist um, and had a political career uh, in parliament. Now, Harriet Hardy... Her father was uh, Thomas Hardy, not the famous novelist, but a surgeon who ensured that she was educated. Uh, she was educated at home. She grew up in the Unitarian Church. Uh, she was involved early on in the politically radical community, active at that time in the church, um, and particularly issues of women's rights. She married John Taylor at age 18, um, and they had three children. During their, their relationship, she stayed active in the church. At first, she wrote a number of short pieces for the Unitarian uh, journal, The Monthly Repository. John Stuart Mill also uh, worked closely with his stepdaughter, Helen Taylor, Helen Taylor, who was obviously um, the daughter of Harriet and John Taylor. 
after Harriet died in, in 1858. So Harriet dies in 1858, and Mill and Helen work together on, again, topics related to feminism and liberalism. Now, the influence of Harriet Taylor on Mill is, is most significant in his work on liberalism, uh, on, on equality, social equality, on his sort of feminist themes, the, on the rights of women. And, you know, today we're going to talk about that major work uh, of, of um, the Mills on liberty. So um, on liberty is sort of John Stuart Mill's statement of his liberal political philosophy, um, uh, Mill and Mills, I should say. Um, in the introduction, they distinguish between two types of threats to liberty. The first is the old kind of uh, threat of, of authoritarian rule um, of monarchs and dictators, right? But also there's a new kind of threat that he's concerned with, the threat of the tyranny of the majority, as he calls it, um, that you might also experience in a democracy. In the book, they consider several reasons that one might seek to restrict liberty, why, why a government might seek to restrict the liberty of its citizens. The first is that you might seek to restrict the liberty of others for their own benefit, right? So government might restrict one's liberty for one's own benefit. This is a paternalistic reason. Now, the, the Mills uh, reject this reason and say this is never an appropriate uh, cause to restrict liberty. They also consider the possibility that we restrict one's liberty in order to ensure that they act morally. And this is known as moralism. And again, they reject that idea. It's not the case that one ought to restrict liberty only to ensure that one acts morally. Third, a government might restrict one's liberty to prevent one from harming others. This is known as the harm principle. And then fourth, one might seek to restrict liberty for utilitarian reasons, um, to maximize happiness and minimize unhappiness. This is the principle of utility or the utility principle. Now, uh, the Mills think that three is a necessary condition, but not by itself sufficient. And the, the fourth condition is not by itself adequate, right? So uh, in other words, they think that in order to restrict liberty, you need to have both. On the one hand, you need to have a harm, right? The possibility of harm, and you need to, pre you need to be preventing harm. So this uh, means that there are no restrictions uh, of one's actions insofar as they only affect oneself. Right? Um, only insofar as they affect others. But even then, restrictions might do more harm than good. So something like this uh, principle number four, the utility principle, uh, also has to be accounted for. In other words, preventing harm is not by itself sufficient. So now it's important to note that in this essay, um, the Mills are not talking about just any kind of rights, any kind of liberties. They have very specific set of liberties in mind, which we might call basic liberties. The first are liberties of conscience, conscience and expression, the liberty to believe uh, what one will and to express one's belief in speech or writing, say. Um, the liberties of action and character, the liberty to um, form one's own tastes and uh, desires and to pursue them, right? Um, and then the liberties of association, liberties of who one interacts with, what kind of groups you form. These are the kinds of liberties that they're talking about, and they devote chap a chapter to each of these um, of these basic liberties. The chapter that I gave you to read is chapter two. Um, it's concerned with the liberties of conscious, conscience and expression, and specifically with freedom of expression. So the argument for the defense of, of free expression is, is complex. Um, now recall a necessary condition on restricting liberty for the mills is the harm principle. So first thing we have to ask is can speech or writing harm someone? Right. It's important to note here that, that the Mills deny that mere offense is a harm. Right. So if I say something to you and you take offense, uh, you know, you don't like what you're hearing um, and, it, and it, it bothers you on an emotional level. That's not sufficient. That's not harm, according to, to this essay. Right. Now, how, no matter how offended you might be by something someone says, that's not a sufficient reason to restrict their ability to say it. 
okay, for the for a, for a government in particular. But of course, in voicing my opinion, I might convince you to believe something false, right? Um, or I might convince you of something true, but that might lead you to to then go act in a way that's going to harm yourself or harm others. So my expression can cause harm, you know, in, in those kinds of ways. And that means, you know, at least there's an, there's an entry here, right? There, we might be justified in restricting free expression because there is some possibility of harm. Now, that possibility of harm is not enough to justify those restrictions. We have to consider not only the harms, but also the benefits of, um, of speech and the harms and benefits of regulating it in order to, to know whether, you know, whether, whether and when restrictions for freedom of expression are, are, are possible or, or necessary. And Mill m mounts a pretty broad defense of a certain kind of freedom of expression. Uh, he does it in, the, in this way. He says, um, look, beliefs... Um, or opinions that one might seek to express, uh, they might be true, right? So the opinion you seek to silence or censor might be true, or they might contain a portion of the truth, or they might be false, right? Mill argues that if the silenced opinion might be true, you know, if the majority believes one thing um, and seeks to censor everything else, one of the things they censor might be the true opinion. Um, and it, and you know, there are, a, obvious reasons that the true opinion is a good thing to have access to. And similarly, it might be the case that, you know, we have several opinions, none, none of which contain the whole truth, but each of which contains a portion of the truth. We, you know, often that's the case, right? Mill also thinks, though, that even if the opinion you seek to express is false, that that has its own benefit in in um, leading to deliberation and discussion because it helps assure that the true opinion does not become a prejudice, right? If if we settle on the true opinion and then we ban all other views from being expressed, you know, we may stop believing the true opinion for good reasons and just become to believe it uh, as as a as a dogma, right? Um, as a prejudice. But if we have to defend the true opinion against false opinions, then it's, uh, we believe it for the right reasons. It becomes lively uh, in, in, our, in our minds because, it, because we have to continue to reaffirm it uh, for the reasons that we believed it in the first place. Also, and this is somewhat more complicated and, and worth to further discussion, Mill thinks that if, if we don't have to compare the true opinion to to alternatives, we might lose the very uh, meaning. You know, it might lose its meaning or significance for us entirely. We wouldn't understand. Um, we wouldn't really even understand what we believe. We would just sort of believe it by rote, right? Um, uh, and that's that's not a good situation either. Now, of course. Mill is keen to point out that we are not infallible. You know, our belief is never uh, s completely certain. So we don't know whether the, um, the opinion in question is true or false or partly true. But insofar as that sort of exhausts the possibilities, he has a defense of, of expressing opinions in all these possible cases, right? Although we don't really know which case we're in. Okay, so that's a very broad um, overview of, uh, of the Mill's arguments and on liberty. Now, you know, how exactly do this, these arguments work? There's a lot more detail here to get into. Are these good arguments in favor of freedom of expression, freedom of speech? What are the limits, right, um, on Mill's view? He doesn't think that it's completely unrestrictable. So what are the possible limits of expression? What kinds of, what are the limits of the argument? What does he leave anything out, right? Is he missing something? Uh, we'll talk about all of this and more uh, in class or on Discord or in the comments here. Let me know if you have uh, any thoughts um, and uh, I look forward to talking with you again soon.